So paper recently open sourced the key value database named JunoDB and I spent a few days going through it to understand its features and guarantees. In a series of videos, I will be going through the database and talking about the key details and design decisions they took while building this. In the process, we will understand how a production grade key value store is built. This is the second video of the series and in this one, I will be talking about the architecture of JunoDB, key components of it, how it is made truly horizontally scalable and more importantly, understand why they took a certain decision over another. So becoming a better engineer is the need of the art and to help you all reach the next level, I have something that you will find amusing. I conduct super practical courses with a no nonsense approach. These courses are designed to help you become a better engineer and ace your career. The courses will definitely reignite your love for engineering and spark the much needed engineering curiosity. Some of my most popular courses are on system design and database internals. Because I operate with a no fluff approach, my courses are enrolled by folks across all levels from SD1s to tech leads to staff to EMs to VP engineering of some of the most prominent companies out there. All the details about the courses like curriculum, prerequisites, testimonials, FAQs can be found on the course pages and I have linked them in the description down below. So do check them out and I cannot wait to see you all become better engineers and ace your engineering career. Now let's go back to the video. So the first component in JunoDB's architecture is called a storage server. Storage server are your regular instances on which you are actually storing the data. These, is, this, these are the instances on which our actual key value data is stored. Storage server accepts operations from another components like get a key, put a key, delete a key, all those operations and they make the changes in the data that is present over there. Right? The storage servers can store the data in memory or on disk depending on the configuration. So this means that JunoDB is not a pure in-memory store. It has persistence as well. Right? The data, because the data that PayPal has can be huge, JunoDB splits the data, basically partitions the data, also called shards, and each storage server is responsible for a bunch of them. So storage server one is responsible for these five shards, storage server two is responsible for these four shards and so on and so forth. Each shard is an instance of RocksDB. RocksDB is a pop, very popular embedded database. In case you are unaware, just a Google search away. So each instance is each, sorry, each shard is an instance of RocksDB that is running. It's a popular embedded database. Now what happens is, the key thing is because you are storing the key value, why would you want to rewrite your own storage layer? Unnecessarily, right? if a solution like RocksDB exists, you just use that. So they use RocksDB to store the actual raw key value pairs over there. So the overall thing, the overall responsibility of storage server is pretty simple. Storage server has a bunch of TCP connections, like it listens on it listens onto a TCP port on which anyone can connect to, any one of the internal component can connect to and ask it to create a, to put a key, delete a key, get a key and all. RocksDB request comes to storage server over this TCP and now your storage server figures out which shard should it go to. It goes to that corresponding shard. These are all local RocksDB instances running on the storage server. It figures out which shard owns the corresponding key and it writes the data writes or reads the data from that corresponding shard and each shard is an instance of rocks tv right this is about the storage server now you could see that because each storage server owns a bunch of shards now the key question comes in how do you know which server or which storage server owns which shard which is where you have to determine data ownership and to answer this one question they use consistent hashing right so Given a shard, which storage server owns it is answered by your consistent hashing algorithm that you put it all them in a ring, the standard consistent hashing algorithm, you put storage servers on the ring, you put shard on, you use the same hash function to hash the, to hash the shard and figure out the one to the immediate right of it. And that's where it goes. A classic consistent hashing implementation. And the key feature of consistent hashing is of minimal data movement. They want to leverage it that in case one of the storage server goes down, who will own this shard becomes really easy. It goes to the next node, to the node, to the right of it. If this node goes down, this node can start owning the request, can start owning the shard. 
right? First thing. Then if you add a new node, you don't have to move data across any of these two. You just copy paste data from here to here and start serving the data, right? Minimal data movement. There are standard benefits of consistent hashing. In case you don't know, just a Google search away, right? So JunoDB uses consistent hashing to determine data ownership or rather shard ownership that which storage server owns which shard, right? So now let's say you have a way to figure it out that given this shard, you know which storage server owns it. Now someone has to use it. So someone has to send the data for the corresponding shard. So who does that? That's where your Juno proxy comes in. So this is a very important design decision that Juno DB took. So there are typically two ways through which your clients, your clients may not be an end user. I've used, I've used uh, basically a stick figure to denote it. It could be server as well. So don't think of it as your end users, FYI. So we have two ways through which your clients can talk to your storage servers. Either your client directly talks to your storage server or you have a proxy sitting in between where your client talks to this proxy and proxy talks to this storage server. So client, if client directly wants to talk to storage server, which means your client needs to know the entire topology that hey, these are the three or five or 10 or 15 storage servers. So I need to know where should I forward the request to. So this makes a lot of configuration being pulled on the client side, which is very inefficient. So what they did is they went for a proxy. So proxy is the one that is abstracting out the topology, the storage server topology for the client. So here what would happen is the Juno proxy servers that they have, the client seamlessly makes request to Juno proxy. Juno proxy establishes persistent connection to all the storage servers that, that are there. And when the request comes in, it figures out which storage server to talk to. It sends the request to that corresponding storage server. That storage server picks out the shard and then writes it into that. Right. This is the flow. This is the advantage of proxy layer. They added this proxy thing so as to abstract out the complexity, the topology information about storage servers. So then giving a very easy way for clients to talk to it. So this is where Juno proxy comes in. Now, advantages of having a proxy based architecture is that your storage topology is abstracted. Second, your client need not connect to all storage servers. And third, your client can have minimal amount of conversion because all they need is a location of Juno proxy. That's it, right? They don't need to know storage servers. They don't need to connect to storage servers directly and maintain persistent connections with them. But is proxy a single machine? Not really, because single machine would not be able to scale. So Juno can have multiple Juno proxies. And this is where consistent hashing is running. So what they do is when the request and obviously because you have multiple Juno proxies, you would have to put them behind a load balancer. Right? So what your clients have, your clients have the IP address or the domain name of this load balancer to talk to. This behind this load balancer are multiple Juno proxy instances that are running. On this Juno proxy instances, using consistent hashing, they are able to figure out that given this request for a particular key, which shard does this request belong to? A simple mod function. Once the shard is known, it uses consistent hashing to figure out which storage server owns this particular shard and the Juno proxy forwards the request to that corresponding storage server. This is the overall flow that happens. Now, given that you have multiple instances of Juno proxy, each having its own quote unquote consistent hashing, which is a map kind of stuff that who owns what. So given that this setting is there, you want this setting to be replicated across all the Juno proxy instances. To do this, they use a strongly consistent distributed key value configuration store called ETCD. They use ETCD running over here, running over here, running over here. Whenever the configuration is changed, it gets reflected to all of them in one shot. That's the beauty of ETCD. That's a guarantee that ETCD provides. Right? And now if you look carefully, the way this entire architecture is set up, this entire architecture is truly horizontally scalable. So a client uses Juno SDK to talk to your Juno backend, right? Juno backend has a load balancer. Load balancers are implicitly horizontally scalable. That's part of how load balancers are designed. Then you have Juno, multiple instances of Juno proxies running. 
Now, multiple because of multiple instances of Juno Proxy is running, you can handle seamlessly handle if there are more incoming requests coming in, you can keep adding more Juno proxies in between. Right? Each instance of Juno Proxy or each server of Juno Proxy has a map stored in their local etcd. Any, any changes in topology on the storage server gets updated in like gets reflected through consistent hashing. Updates go to uh, etcd. ETCD because it is strongly consistent across in a uh, strongly consistent in a distributed fashion. The updates seamlessly go to all these three instances and the map is changed. The next request can come in can go to that corresponding servers over here. Right now this is horizontally scalable. This is horizontally scalable. And here if you look carefully, if your one storage server is getting too hot, you can add one more storage server and then add one more storage server if you want to. You can fix the number of shards over here, but you can keep adding storage servers and do that shard movement over here and just update your consistent hashing and etc. Right. So you can see how beautifully this entire architecture is truly horizontally scalable. Right. And these are the key components of Juno DB. First one is a storage server in which your data is sharded and stored. Each shard is an instance of rocks DB that is running. Then you have Juno proxies that sits in between that maintains persistent connections to storage servers. To determine data ownership, they use consistent hashing. To distribute those, distribute the configuration across Juno proxy servers, they use etcd to do it. When the request comes in, it has to go to one of the Juno proxy, which is why they are abstracted behind the load balancer. So request from your Juno SDK, like your C++ SDK, Java SDK, and Golang SDK, Node SDK, and all, they talk to this load. They talk to this load balancer. Load balancer forwards the request to one of this Juno proxy. This proxy, using consistent hashing, determines where should it forward the request to. It forwards the request to that corresponding storage server. Storage server picks out from this key which shard it belongs to. It sends the data to that corresponding shard. Right? And on that corresponding shard, the get or put or delete whatever operation is taken, it does that. It sends the response to proxy. Proxy sends the response back to load balancer and it goes back to the client. And now client has its operation completed. And this is the overall flow with this corresponding architecture. And the beauty of it is these are the key components and this is the kind of kind. Like they are all truly horizontally scalable. So yeah. This is all what I wanted to, as, to cover as part of your JunoDB architecture. You see the importance of proxy. You see how consistent hashing they're using. You see how they're using etcd to have strongly consistent distributed key value configuration store across Juno proxies. Right? And you see how you can have horizontally scalable storage servers. We'll talk about scalability a bit more in the future videos. So the next video, this was the second video of this series. The next video is where I'll be talking heavily about scaling it being truly horizontally scalable. We went through just a brief of it that how this is scalable, this is scalable, but we go deeper into how the storage layer is actually scaled and why it is so important for a database like JunoDB in the next one. So yeah, I hope you found it interesting. Hope you found it amusing. That's it for this one. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a ton.